Uh, we now have a panel, as you told, revolutionising business to drive and deliver sustainable growth in the future, and very much in the theme of all the sessions and discussions we've had so far today. We've got a very esteemed and inspiring panel with us here this afternoon. And just to put a little bit of context, I think, as Charles said, we're talking about revolutionary change. I mentioned this morning one figure, which was that we need to increase our carbon productivity tenfold over the next four decades. Everything coming, coming. we make, everything we do, everything we can We're ahead of schedule, is it? With one tenth of the carbon emissions. We know that that means effectively decarbonizing the power system. Which one? Oh. We know that that means radical changes and improvements in energy efficiency. It means changes in the way we do business. I've got five and soon to be six panelists with me here this afternoon who are right at the heart of this transformational change that we need. So I'm going to introduce them one by one and ask them to give a few moments of introduction from their, the perspective of their sector and their company. What is their vision within this transformational change that we need? What's the vision of how their sector is going to have to be transformed and what it will begin to look like in the coming decades? And within that context, a few brief examples of what they're doing already. Then we'll open it up for a bit of discussion on the panel and then towards the end, ask you, invite you to come and ask questions. And I would encourage those who are taking Jim Leap's uh, analogy earlier on are sitting around the edges waiting to be asked to dance. To, do feel free to come forward. None of us bite as far as I know and you'll hear and see better. So, our first speaker is Ranjit Batakur, founder and chairman, GMS and senior advisor to Tata Consulting Services. Brings 30 years of successful experience in managing and leading organizations in a wide range of industries. Worked in the telecoms industry. It's focused now on innovation and reinvention across IT, healthcare, agriculture, and tourism. And he's the chief architecture of the thought process of nature economics. Please, Ranjit, a few words from you. Yeah, hi there. Uh, the way that we've been trying to define business is to break it down and actually understand what business is. And, you know, to such an educated lot of uh, people, it would be difficult to really pass muster if I didn't share this with you. Uh, very often I notice in these meetings and conferences, there is business and there is government. But I cannot understand or I cannot even imagine that there is business without government and I cannot believe there is government without business. So the first thing, the context of what I want to say it, is actually that government and business is actually hand in hand. One is for governance and one is actually to create it. In this context, we must understand that the governance of business is critical and one of the things that I notice, neither at a country level, nor at a business level, that in general, 90% of the world has not actually even defined what an ecological footprint could be. Our own business towards creating innovation has been trying to define a framework of the components of such business which consists of the delivery arms of business in private and public sector or in government. And in that we find there are five important components. One is land, in any way that you want to look at it. Next is energy. Next is water. Next is waste. And next is air. We believe that LEWAC, as we call it, C, the C of LEWAC is the output which is carbon. So just LIWA is up to the A, which is air, and C is carbon. When you look at these components, you find that actually that innovation is always possible. After all, the challenge that we really have and the challenge that I have across businesses, because we, we actually do this footprinting or baselining as we call it, and we try and understand what goes into this to actually make the paradigm shift to make 
the difference. In fact, at an earlier session, I think many of the speakers referred and alluded to the fact that in business, unless we know where we are, we won't know where to go. And an incremental change of reducing carbon by 5% or 10% is not really likely to be the challenge. What we've looked at across sectors, and if you look at the services business, which includes, say, banking and hotels, say, they're being two large parts of the services business that we know. The carbon footprint reduction that we've done, say, in hotels and banking, or the footprint of just managing their land, energy, waste, and water. In the case of waste and water, it has almost gone down to zero. In other words, if they use water, it's called cradle to cradle. It's from a book in Switzerland, where actually the water that you put in is as pure as the water that you put out. So if every country and every company did that, I think this whole challenge that we have on water may be a little less. It's not, you need innovative technologies, there are. You need innovative implementation, which is more important. Having said that, I think the next paradigm where the partnership with government is, is compliance management. So one is if you know what is baselining, in all these areas of business and governance, is that how do you actually use compliance and compliance management techniques which are published to make this entire baselining real and therefore help them to chase a target, which is the paradigm shift of technology and innovation, to make compliance of that baseline and reduction or increase, <coughs> as the case may be, the relevant issue. We've done this across the manufacturing industry, in fact, namely Tata Steel, and we find that they have saved, say, 30% energy. The plans over the next 15 years are to move to renewable energy because in this energy rating system that we have, the green energy that we actually talk about, which is completely carbon-free, would actually be an uptake of a benefit, even though the price of it is less, but in their nature, rating system, they would get a certain percentage. So let's take Tata Steel. The whole exercise is not complete because all the components are not in terms of LEVAC, is that we find that their share prices are say 3,000 rupees for 10 rupee share. But their baseline, which we actually set at zero, actually is minus 20 because of the fact that they use they are carbon intensive because of the energy intensity that they have or the water intensity they have and the impurities that they leave behind. So we have a calculative mode to do this. So this is nothing but a pure mode. We don't even have to get into big economics to understand that this valuation is right or wrong because it's just based on a zero factor of evaluation called the green index. I must you know, caution that while in doing this and sharing this with you, it's evolutionary. And now we've got three, four partners, which includes Oxford University, which includes two universities in India, Yale University, and the London School of Economics. What they've said is that just the footprinting exercise or green indexing exercise is not good enough. Why don't we now put a value to it? So we've extrapolated that and actually gone into the economic regime of saying that there must be value. And in line with the subject of today, I will leave uh, with the next statement saying, unless there's a valuation of this entire ecological paradigm, I do not believe that this next shift is likely to happen in time to save the planet or in time to understand the value. And to make my point even clearer and leave this thought with you, the value of these trees in this park, if you look out, is probably unknown. Long, huh? But if I cut the trees and make furniture out of it, there is a value. If we look at the fish in the pond, and we actually imagine there is fish, nobody even knows how many there is, so therefore there's no baselining. But we took this fish and it was, if it were edible and we sold it in the market, there's a value. So therefore the whole purpose of this valuation methodology is, the river, the fish, the forest, no value. But that's the ecology we all talk about, that's the economy business talks about, that's the e economics that the economist talks about, and that's the governance we talk about. Unless we change, and the biggest demand is we have to move to green indexing alongside with economic indexing, and alongside with that we need a valuation of green indexing to make this paradigm shift. 
Thank you very much, Ranjit. Our second speaker is uh, Sean DeClean. He is currently the co-chair of the Africa Agricultural Growth and Investment High Level Task Force. That's quite a title of a task force. And also vice chair of the Tanz Tanzanian Kilimo Kwanza Growth Corridors Executive Committee. Uh, your board of the World Economic Forum and a whole lot of other extremely important sounding things, but I think that's <laughs> not enough. I'll let you speak instead of me, Sean. Sure. Okay, um, it, it's, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, we've reached one of those you know, crisis points, I think, in the world, where in many ways the world as we know it is broken. And, and I think one of, but at the same time, I think what's exciting about that is it really forces us to, to come up with the opportunities. And I think that's the challenge that we have uh, today. You know, how do we as, uh, how do we as companies, as government, you know, in terms of that relationship with civil society, you know, actually address issues at a massive level very, very quickly. And it's that scale speed imperative that we've hit. We've talked about scale for a long time. We've talked about partnerships. We haven't really talked about it in terms of speed. And, uh, and then at the same time, that has to be brought back down to, you know, in agriculture, this is about individuals feeding themselves and their families. In Africa, where I've spent most of my life living, I was in Malawi for six years, and you, I mean, this is real to, to your average person. You know, to, if you're a, a farmer, normally it's a woman farmer who's producing 80% of the, the crops in, in Africa. I don't know what the men do, but we have something to answer for. Uh, but, uh, I mean, in East Africa, you know, she's gone through one of the worst droughts in, uh, in the last 50 years and, and now, you know, you're getting extensive flooding and some of the worst flooding we've seen in decades. So for them, climate change is happening right now, this season, and they need to be able to feed their families and that. So, so the imperative is critical. So we can talk about when the world hits 9 billion in the next you know, number of years and all that, but there is a real here and now about this. And so I think what's dynamic about why I've enjoyed working on what has been done in Tanzania, where they, the President Kikwete has driven this idea of an agricultural growth corridor, engaging through the World Economic Forums when they reached out through what was their new vision for agriculture, where 25 companies got together and came up with a 2020-20 vision that we would reduce greenhouse emissions in agriculture by 20% every decade, increase, increase uh, rural incomes by 20% in that same decade, and, uh, and also increase productivity. But that then had to be, that, that needed specificity. You needed somewhere for that to, to be shown that it can work rather than some nice document that's waved around at Davos, you know, in the snow in January. And, and Kikwete, President Kikwete really took that challenge and said, right, we are going to drive this idea of an agricultural growth corridor, take the railroad network through to, to Zambia and uh, the electricity network that goes with that, which is the size of Italy, so we're not talking a small piece of land, and then parcel that up into clusters and, uh, and really look at whether you can integrate smallholder farmers at scale into commercial farming models. And, uh, and so they've developed a 20-year blueprint for that, you know, which sees lifting 2 million people out of poverty, having a significant impact. So this isn't a sort of six-month, I want to be re-elected re next term you know, agenda. This is a long-term committed 20-year vision. And, uh, and then I think what's quite exciting is over the last, as that's gone forward in the last 12 months, they're now trying to develop a green corridor overlay onto that. It's a very ambitious, you know, big vision, a lot of leadership and drive and commitment from individual champions who have worked with the president to make this happen from the private sector side, the government side, civil society and the donor side. At the heart of that model is the concept of catalytic financing, and this is one of the critical challenges. Because if we, we need to reinvent the models, and they need to be models that are done at scale. We need to blend government financing so that it can leverage private sector financing. I'm sitting here next to Sim, so it just makes me use this example. But you know, where Agra came to, to Standard Bank and said, look, if we put in $5 million, I think it was, 
five or ten million dollars, and they have leveraged from Standard Bank fifty million dollars worth of the same investment to go into smallholder farming. It's that leverage concept that's also so important. How do you use public finance to leverage in at scale private sector finance in a responsible manner? And uh, and so that. And that requires a catalytic mindset from governments and from donor financing institutions, which is not there at the moment, which they're really struggling with. And, and what was exciting about Tanzania, the moment we proposed this and we got it going, the first million dollars that came into this catalytic financing was from the Tanzanian government out of their own treasury themselves. It wasn't from a donor, it wasn't Tanzania getting it through a donor, it was Tanzania's own money. What's interesting about the task force is President Kikwete took that to the World Economic Forum in Africa this, uh, th this May, challenged other leaders and said, we need to, working with the president of uh, Mozambique, who's done a similar kind of corridor in Beira, and said, we need to be doing this at scale across Africa now. And so they set up this task force, uh, which I have the honor of co-chairing, and it's very exciting, with the African Union, to see could 10 countries in Africa drive a similar kind of, not necessarily a corridor model, but a similar large-scale transformative partnership that takes sustainable agriculture to scale in those countries, develops the kinds of investment blueprints that are going to be needed. And so what's exciting is that it really allows, so you're not just seeing agriculture companies coming in now, you're seeing a range of different NGOs saying, you know, plug and play type approach, and we're doing this, can we bring this in? You've seen the banking service you know, come in and look at alternative models. Vodacom have just signed an MOU with Tanzania to, to, do, uh, uh, to come in and try and develop the rural cell phone technology that will go out to farmers and provide them with the sort of information base they need, doing what they did in Kenya with SafariCop with Impesa in the, the money transfer through cell phone thing, but doing this with the rural market. So I think if we could was at a discussion yesterday where Jim Leake said if we could come up with you know, 10 of these kinds of transformative partnerships that involve this nexus between water, energy, food, and climate change at scale and really over the next six months use this dynamic sort of series of events that are coming up with Rio Plus 20 you know, in six months' time and really drive a, a bottom-up energized at scale vision of the future I, I think we can do something quite profound and we don't need to wait for the green fund to you know, green gear and set up and all of that we can just go ahead and make this happen great thanks so much i think the message there is well, said something right there um message about not having to wait for international processes well li jung feng knows something about that we've heard already about the extraordinary growth of renewable energy in China. And Li Jung Feng is the Deputy Director of the Energy Research Institute, part of the National Development and Reform Commission, right at the heart of Chinese policy making. He's also part of the, uh, as part of the Energy Research Institute, he was a co-chair of REN21, and most excitingly, or interestingly perhaps, led the development of the Chinese renewable energy law. So, knows how, how to make these things work. Li, a few words from you. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, it's hard to say about energy issues. You see, everyone talk about energy, especially like this COP11. The people are talking about negotiate about 20 years. The major target is to reduce the carbon. A lot of people, including the WWF, they said the decarbon issues. Maybe decarbon is okay, but the energy is very important. That's very difficult. You couldn't reduce the energy use by the kind of improve the kind of economic situation and improve daily life. Especially in the, the poor, very poor area, if uh, there are about uh, two billion of the population without uh, sufficient uh, electricity supply, so you meet that kind of economic development, uh, generate the income, you have to have energy. Therefore, the renewable energy may be one of the solution. You can, for the kind of uh, increase kind of income, also reduce the carbon uh, emissions. You can combine that one uh, together. You say you think about that uh, ten years ago, the wind is about uh, one dollar 
when you、uh, when you roll per watt. But now it's like、uh, below two kind of when you roll per watt already.、Uh, like ten years ago, almost five or four euros per watt of the PV. But now come to about one euro, even less per watt. That means that by the kind of technology、uh, revolution and by the kind of system revolution, also mechanical revolution, you can tremendously to enlarge the market. And reduce the cost, make the renewable、uh, be affordable for all the people, not only for the rich people. Now you say the most of the wind, the PV in the European, American, but now they go to India, China, and other countries. They make the other people affordable.、Uh, even there are some treat the kind of issues, like the China, USA have the dumping issues. But、uh, it's a fact, the cost of renewables become. The kind of lower and the lower and affordable for the people. It not not only happened in China, also India, and even in the Brazil. The last、uh, last three months ago, I think in the in the this summer, I mean,、uh, in the, in the some big、uh, kind of concessional program in Brazil, is、uh, the wind turbines. It's about four、uh, hundred to five hundred euros per kilowatt. That's a with very cheap the kind of turbines are available, that can make a lot of、uh, compatible with the kind of、uh, mineral energy already. It's、uh, the price like、uh, Mr. Xie mentioned the solar, about fifteen、uh, US cents per kilowatt hours. I think even lower now, maybe around about ten、uh, to twelve. Like、uh, by twenty fifteen, even lower, like ten、uh, cents per kilowatt hours. It should be available. Wind is mixed that already. Wind in the most of the country, including Germany, Spain, China, USA, is about、uh, like、uh, five to seven U U.S. cents per kilowatt hours. It's mixed.、Uh, everybody affordable already. I mean, so that by this kind of developed kind of renewable energy technology, we can not only meet the energy demand, also you can make it. Cash generations for the poor. You can imagine about that. Even like、uh, African countries, like the good sun. As as gas, you couldn't plant anything. You can generate money like PV and wind. You have one wind turbines. Every year, how much money you can generate? You can calculate about that. You have one of the kind of solar PV farms. You can generate more money than your cotton, than your grain, than your watermelon. So I think that's a good kind of、uh, example. We we need it to work together,、uh, use the kind of renewables not only for climate change, but also for the kind of economic de- development, the kind of、uh, elevating for the kind of poverty reductions, also to generate for the poor people. I think the the renewable revolution revolution will be the kind of good kind of result for every country. Not only for the rich country. Thank you very much indeed. Now, one of the themes behind all of this, and probably the theme of the climate negotiations, is money. How do we pay for this? We've heard about the need for catalytic finance, innovative finance, and so on and so forth. And our next speaker, Kyle Kokwezu, is probably uniquely、uh, positioned to be able to speak to this. Is a vice chairman of Deutsche Bank Group, long time、uh, part of the World Bank Group, and also a deputy finance minister in Germany. He's Brings together a number of perspectives. So, Kaio, a few thoughts from you on this. <coughs> Thank you.、Um, much has been said already, so let me be, be brief. Of course, on the climate finance front, and particularly for us as the finance industry, we have not met the challenge of vastly scaling up or using public-private partnerships, using public money to leverage up much larger flows of uh, climate. Uh, Finance, and not only, of course, in the emerging and developing markets, much beyond the 100 billion put as a target in the AGF report last year. I was a member of that、uh, group. So, a few points. One, obviously, nothing moves markets innovation better than prices. But we will be f- failed by the UN process,、uh, Kyoto, to generate that price. In fact, the prices we have are in disarray.、Um, I hope very much, as the Australians are doing and others, that at regional level, Europe,、uh, at、uh, sectoral level, something that I would call 
a pricing mechanism can, be, can still be uh, created. Whether that's cap and trade or taxes, that we make at least some modest progress, but I don't expect much. By the way, I think the CDM should be preserved. Uh, it needs professionalization. It needs a sectoral approach. So there's a bit that can be done there, but not much. That brings me to a second point in the absence of a carbon price. Nick Stern, who will speak this afternoon, the greatest failure in pricing and externality in human history. So hopefully you get there sometime. Incentives more broadly. And here, of course, there's a whole array, but let me just mention one. We, we as Deutsche Bank also promoting much, also based on the German experience, is the feed and tariff regimes uh, that, however, are credible in terms of their longevity, certainty, transparency for renewables. I really believe and I applaud the South African government. Uh, they launched SARI. It's very much taking track. India, we heard very good cases. So I think in other incentives using FITs for, for renewables can go a long, a long way. Thirdly, then how you scale up. The many good examples on financing individual projects, schemes, innovation. You made a point. I mean, obviously, there is no scale yet. This is very painstaking work. You have to take these cases. You have to bring around one table the pension funds, the insurers, the banks, the project developers, I mean, the, those who really know, and develop a body of best practice that then can be scaled. Tough, nobody has done it. We all talk about we are an A, we need to get to B, but how you get from A to B in terms of scaling up this finance is on. But there's good work underway in different fora, and we are participating. Again, on scaling up a finance, I would, beyond the price point I made, very much like to address the risk point. I mean, beyond the traditional risks, of course, on credit, on country and technology, there is the policy risk. These are policy-driven markets. And unless what we in Deutsche Bank coined, I think everybody uses now, TLC, again, transparency, longevity, and certainty, we will not get very, very far. And here I come to, my, uh, to the point on the global, on the Green Climate Fund that is being negotiated. I really hope at the end of the week there will be a strong private sector facility as part of that, that is professionally run, frankly, not by bureaucrats like CDM was at some point, but really professionals. That relates then to, say, take renewables, to best practice fit regimes that gives you TLC in a sense at the micro level, which are incorporated in the many NAMAS that are under preparation now. NAMAS with MRV give you TLC at the country level, the macro level in a sense. And then you build on that through the uh, uh, private sector window by bringing in development banks. 19 have got together now, huge balance sheets. First loss financing, what EIB, KFW, IFC are doing. And then, of course, the private sector. And, of course, the ambition has to be here that after a certain number of years, for example, in South Africa under SARI, the maturing technologies, the cost curve, the maturing institutional setup, and the techniques of instrument scaling up can leave us alone in the task. I'm talking now private uh, finance. And we don't need the Green Climate Fund anymore. We might not even need NAMAS because this becomes business as usual. That would be true scaling up through what's being negotiated uh, here. Uh, next point, just to support very much what was already said. We have to get away from a notion that the sequence is civil society demands, policymakers set the regulatory framework, business then starts operating. We will not get that leadership from, from, poli from politics, neither internationally nor often uh, locally. So that's why the coalitions that were mentioned, bottom-up approaches, where we invert that sequence. Civil society, broadly speaking, demands. We, the business community, then form coalitions of like-minded. The consumer durables, in the co consumer goods industry, for example, met in, uh, in Atlanta, to go through the supply chain, set carbon reduction targets, and then, or we was Desert Tech, what we are doing in Europe, concentrating solar power from Sahara. These are iconic, long-term transitional schemes. Of course, you have to start small. And then we go to the politicians, or the European Commission, as we are doing, for a super grid, for transporter feed and tariffs, and say, look, guys, if we do that as 50 companies now in Desert Tech, we need a European super grid, Mr. Attinger, we need crossing border feed and tariffs that are initially subsidized for Morocco, where the first projects will be. In other words, these coalitions that don't wait, that simply start. And let me point you on Rio. I think Rio next year should not be a boring 
yet another negotiation process where the sideshow is the business community and the civil society. It should again be the other way around. The real show in Rio would be the message of the new Rio for the next 20 years would be this bottom-up approach where you really bring civil society business and of course we don't exclude the, the politicians together in forming these coalitions and launch, not just talk about, say the consumer goods industry with their targets, many desert techs and so on. And there are many things underway that could serve for that. And again, they are not report to the UN, but let them come and visit in the platform, in the laboratory of these ideas and launch pad, the private sector in working with them. That would be very different, Rio. Final point, I very much support that also we in the financial industry with everybody else have to develop out of this present crisis with the new normal, meaning much lower volatile growth in the coming decade at least, the new opportunity of terms of crisis to transformation. I make that very concrete. I think Jeremy Oppenheim will also speak here today. McKinsey has done a very good study on resource productivity. I would embed it in the much larger notion of three billion new entrants to the middle class in the next 25 years. Enormous pressure on all resources from water to energy, climate and all the rest. How you now define progress the way in the past it was measured by labor productivity by resource productivity, make out of that a story for technological leapfrogging and, and um, innovation. The Chinese have understood that, by the way. And finally, for renewed growth out of all this. That would then motivate, hopefully, policy change of a different nature than, frankly, in this UN negotiations at the moment. If we were really lucky, politicians might become redundant, but you never know. Uh, anyway, moving in another part of the finance sector, we have with us Sim Chavalala, who is the CEO of Standard Bank South Africa, talking about bottom-up approaches. My, one of my concerns about bottom-up is we do the bottom, but we don't get up. You, I know, already have had in good examples of work where you've taken small things and you've used your financing to scale them up, and so I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Sure, Mark. Um, I think it's wonderful to come from a country such as South Africa, where I believe that the policy environment is conducive to innovation. And so the country's national climate change white uh, paper speaks eloquently about some of the things that my colleagues have been speaking about. The need to coordinate policy. The need to coordinate policy not only domestically but also internationally. Um, secondly, uh, as Pliny the Elder, uh, first century Roman author once said, uh, ex Africa semper aliquid novi. Something mm. interesting always comes out of Africa. Not many people know that uh, South Africa is the second country after the UK to have issued a code on uh, responsible investment in South Africa, where the investment community has got a code that, takes, that determines sustainability considerations in the calculation of risk-adjusted returns. Now, in the life of a bank, capital is cardinal in a manner very different to that of a manufacturing company because we use capital to hold against the risks that we assume either in lending uh, or in trading. So the first thing is that it's very interesting that South African institutional investors and the investment community is thinking very, very carefully about uh, taking these sorts of risks into account when they determine uh, return on capital. Secondly, we've got a burgeoning uh, uh, industry of uh, people thinking carefully about um, uh, about green bonds and about uh, green indices uh, because these are important to set the, the framework within which we would, uh, would all be innovating. More importantly, inside our own company, we're proud to say that uh, we are not just the largest financial institution of the, on the African continent with assets of uh, 1.3 trillion rand, um, we're also the largest carbon trader. Uh, to the extent of 90 uh, million tons last year and 20 million, 95 million tons and 25 million tons in uh, emission abatements. In going through and in participating in that market, we have been innovating. Uh, we have got armies of risk managers that are schooled uh, in understanding uh, these, these instruments. And we've also got, uh, I would say, also armies of transactors and project financiers that are actually executing transactions even as we speak. And so uh, we have uh, an extensive uh, CDM program uh, operating both on the African continent and also out of our London operations. 
Um, and as a consequence of these programs, I'm able to say to you, not only do we approach it from commercial considerations, but I can say, I know that thousands of women in Burkina Faso um, have been able to cut the cost of, uh, of, uh, of their fuel by about 25% through the utilization of uh, lamps uh, that have been replaced uh, where they used to use kerosene lamps. I know that in Ghana, we're participating in the first uh, project that is uh, meant to uh, deal with waste uh, in, in that environment. Uh, in Zimbabwe, we participated in a, in a project that is going to reduce uh, 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 nitric acid uh, in, in, in certain projects there. In Nelson Mandela Bay, we participated in the rollout of uh, solar water heaters to the extent of 70,000, the target is 230,000. And so I can say to you that uh, this is not in the space of phantasm or dream world. Uh, it's fully integrated into our organizations. It's part of the projects uh, that we do. It's a new asset class, for example, the independent power producers. Uh, and our activity spans not just the corporate and investment bank, but, uh, but the retail bank. I'll leave it at that for, for the moment. We can talk about the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid later. But that's, Great. Uh, Thank you very much, Sim. And our final speaker on the panel is Mwambu Wanendea, who is Vice President and Head of Communications uh, for Ericsson in Africa responsible for corporate social responsibility across 43 countries. So tell me, Ericsson, in the ICT sector, one of the bits of the future, clearly, what's your vision for what that future looks like for you and for Ericsson? Well, the ICT sector contributes 2% of carbon dioxide emissions globally, but can have a significant impact on reducing the other 98% contributed by other industries. We believe that before 2020, we can reduce this other 98% by about 15% using ICT in many different ways. Our vision as Ericsson is a world in which there are 50 billion mobile connections by the year 2020. At present, there are about 7 billion, which is in excess of the population of the world. So the things that will be connected are people, people to people, people to machine, machine to machines. And many of these gadgets that will be connected will help us live in a more sustainable future. Some have yet to be invented, some are currently invented. An analogy for this is when electricity was invented, somebody said, yes, that will be very useful for lighting my house at night. But when one thinks of electricity now, it's gone beyond lighting your house at night into many different spheres. You look at Bluetooth, when Bluetooth was invented, it's now standardized, it's used in many different gadgets. So this is the kind of interconnected world in which we believe in at Ericsson. Globally, 50 billion connections. We're working with governments to help create this. We're working in policy aspects. The group CEO, Hans Vestberg, is a UN Broadband Commission. And he's working within that framework to show governments and industries how broadband can be used in development and have a significant impact. Of course, there are well-known statistics showing, for example, an increase in 10% of mobile connections increases a country's GDP by 1%. And furthermore, an increase in broadband increases the GDP even higher because people are able to use connectivity in many different ways to assist them in working. If we look at our vision of a network society, we can see a society in which uh, a, uh, a car can be connected to a smart grid. Many cars, particularly in the Western world, are driven by one person, have one occupant, and if there's an accident, there's nobody to report that a serious accident has occurred, where it has occurred, and call the emergency services. If you look at many of the national grids now, about 50% of some of the power in some of the grids is lost before it gets to the end consumer. So by implementing smart grids, people can find out where is the electricity going to, where is it being lost, when is it needed. A society in which somebody can sit at their desk, receive an SMS from the power company, whatever that power company is, and obviously people have spoken here about new ways of producing power, solar energy. Maybe uh, the people here may have uh, panels on their roof producing power and when they're in the office, their home consumption is low so they can sell that power back into the national grid. The national grid be needs to be able to measure it, uh, pay you for your power that you're producing and sell it on to other people where that power is needed. So a smart grid will work with this. Maybe you're sitting in your office the utility company, by whatever means, sends you an SMS saying there's low power consumption in your area. We'll give you a 20% reduction in power if you use power in the next hour. And you take an option to switch on your washing machine because it's cheaper then. 
So we really believe that by using smart grids, we can transform the consumption and production of power and the transmission of it. We can also use smart grids in other areas. Uh, in this network society, we can see ICT playing a big role, and it's happening now. In Johannesburg, we have a project we implemented with the city of Johannesburg on a commercial contract. We are laying over 1,000 kilometers of fiber. It will take away the need for the city to pay uh, charges for calling each their employees and access to their databases and so on. And we proposed this project to a bank. I don't think it was your bank, Sim, but the next project we're coming to you. But the bank saw it was a commercially feasible project and gave us a loan, and it's running as a project. It's up and implemented, running next year. The other 85% is available to commercial organizations. Uh, maybe Sims Bank may want to put the ATMs on this ultra-fast broadband uh, fiber network. Maybe people in the entertainment business may want to have uh, downloadable movies. Maybe people in education, government may want to send out lessons on this network so that if you have uh, skills shortage, you can have one teacher in one location teaching a specialist subject to schools across the municipality. So this is happening now. It's happening in South Africa. And I could tell you more about projects where we're using ICT for development in a sustainable manner within Africa. And of course, one of the big projects we have on a municipal basis is in the city of Stockholm. We're transforming the Royal Seaport within, eight year, within 18 years. We're transforming that into a new area where there'll be 10,000 new homes, 600,000 square meters of office spaces, 30,000 working places. Uh, the cruise ships that come in will no longer consume diesel in the port but will be connected to the electric grid, which of course means it has to be a smart grid so that it's told there's a power, incoming power consumer coming in with, who will require a lot of electricity. So this is our broader vision, 50 billion connections in a network society where we're interdependent, we learn from each other, we share from each other, and we develop together with a lower carbon footprint, of course. Great, thank you very much. Now, that was great, that was a really concrete vision, something that's gonna happen. Are you gonna make that happen, or is it just a vision? No, we're making it happen. The city of, uh, the royal city of, uh, the royal port of Stockholm, that's underway. The city of Johannesburg, that's underway. Uh, already we've connected about 100 buildings. And what we found when we laid this fiber, we laid it for the city of Johannesburg, but there are other people who are interested in us laying more fiber for them, connecting it to this grid so they can benefit from it. Okay, so this is like an example, Pai, of what you were saying, where instead of waiting for policy, businesses can do something and then, it, in a way, educate the policymakers so they understand what policies need to be put into place. Now, people have been talking today about scale and speed, and neither are happening sufficiently at the moment. So, Kai, from the perspective as a Deutsche Bank, you know, a large bank needs policy certainty, but you know you're not going to get it yet or straight away. Where do you see the opportunities to act now and drive that process forward? Where, where are the big wins you can get to show people that this works? Well, let me first say that uh, while we have come a long way, uh, the present financial crisis is certainly not conducive to shrinking balance sheets and, and the big problems we face in Europe to uh, jump ahead. And of course, by inclination, large banks think more in terms of next 18 months than the next 18 years, but we, we have come, uh, come a long way. I see a lot of scope in the energy sector along the lines that I explained, uh, if we find what I call the painstaking work of going through what constitutes schemes to mitigate policy risk, the other risks, if we have the scaling up initially through so public-private partnership, I see no reason. We listened to the India example yesterday, and I'm talking, of course, also to the domestic banks in all these countries to come to scale, um, to come to scale very quickly. I think the energy sector particularly, but of course there are many other sectors we can do it. I see increasingly, in fact, what I talked about, about this bottom up, the companies that are springing up from China to California and others that need financing, that need IPOs. That's where we do a lot of business in the renewable area. But I think in the end, it's, it's really a question of TLC. We need a minimum of stability. Look at the solar tariffs in Europe, Spain and others. You cannot have TLC if there's not more continuity on that side. And they, I think there we have to go to politicians and say, look, I mean, we are willing to do it, but uh, give us that. So, uh, well, I could go on in terms of many other areas. Uh, I think countries are not monolithic. 
there is now a body of knowledge and a willingness to work with the private sector in even those countries that in the UN negotiations here don't even want to see a private sector facility in the uh, GCF. And how, and that's why I used Rio as, um, as an example. We have to create these laboratories of ideas, the launching pads for these initiatives. We Deutsche Bank, as we are doing with Desert Tech, this is big, starting small, obviously, in Morocco, uh, wants to be a part of. Clean tech made in Germany, we are forging coalitions of the, uh, the technology companies, the automotive industry. Germany is quite leading, but of course the Chinese are catching up quickly. How do you bring insurance companies, banks into that? So I like very much this bottom-up notion of, of, uh, of coalitions. Sure. I mean, I just wanted to build on something Kaya said, because if you're going to take bottom up, I think also we, what we have, which we didn't have a while ago, because of the broadband side of it and that, is the opportunity to think open innovation as well. And, um, and I think you know, we can really start to apply this mm. in a very dynamic way. Uh, I, I think, I mean, a lot of the risk issues, I mean, I challenge the banks, you know, uh, from time to time, because a lot of the risk issues are held quite tightly you know, within a yeah. bank's IP. And there may be a component of those, you know, 20%, which they genuinely need to hold as IP. But probably there's 80%, and I'm just making up numbers here, uh, that, that actually you could use in a more open space thing. But the problem is you're not sure what it is, so you bundle the whole up as an IP framework, and, you know, and we don't use that open source architecture that, that we could in a really dynamic way. And I think for something like climate change adaptation and mitigation, we need, if we're going to do the scale and the speed that we did, we need to look at how we do this. And, and using maybe open source architecture, I missed this very nice lunch today because I grabbed a quick sandwich on the run uh, with my chairman, you know, while we, uh, we, we talked with, you know, the MD of Planetary Skin. Now, you know, if you don't know this organisation, you should. It's, uh, you know, it's a very dynamic. Uh, so here you have an organisation that's been set up by Cisco and NASA to provide sort of knowledge mm -hmm. reference tools in an open source way. Risk. You know that for us as you know, and here you've got a large fertiliser company that would never normally have an engagement like this, having a very interesting and exciting lunch about how. You know how you could actually look at these kinds of things using open source to look at this water, food, energy, climate change nexus. And I think if we can also, so it's not just about getting the coalitions of the willing together and, and driving that, it's also using some of the, the technology that we have at the moment and to think in a dynamic open source way. I mean, if, if Linux computers can run today in competition against Apple and Microsoft and all those players still using an open source platform. There is no reason we couldn't use that kind of thinking in a, in a very dynamic, uh, dynamic way. There's obviously limitations, but we're obviously only going to be able to do that if we really figure out what those, what those limitations are and where we need to go back to saying, OK, this is proprietal, but there is a large area which we can work together to, to solve some of the gaps. And, uh, and bringing cross-sector and, you know, I mean, even in the private sector, I can assure you, doing public-private partnerships is tough. Doing private-to-private -private partnerships is often just or even more difficult sometimes. And uh, sure. so, uh, so, so I think that's, you know, we, we need to take these issues and then we need to be bold about how we actually think through the solutions. Great, thanks, John. Ranjit, a few words from you and then I'm going to open it up to questions. So get your questions ready. No, I think I'll be a little naughty. I don't know whether this is working. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you know, from the conversation, I get an impression that most of what we talk is a very Western approach to this entire solution. The three things that come out in any of these discussions. One is, I think we are obsessed with carbon. It's not a bad thing because at least there's something to touch and feel, but I think there's an obsession around it. Two, I think there's an obsession around climate change. Because the real issue is not just climate change. The real issue is actually the entire ecological footprint. And we actually come back to the climate change. This is very well architected and driven because that's the economics we understand. Thirdly, I think the model that China has approached is possibly the right model. In fact, why are we talking about governments? Everything in China, most of it, is either government supported, government funded, and government sponsored. Look at where they've gone in solar. You just heard it. 
Why are we trying to invent and actually say that there should be an approach which is only bottom up? That is very Western because hmm. actually the top down uh, approach is in fact probably much better. Really? In fact, I'm just I'm just being naughty, you know, because but I just think that if the Chinese Cannot model works, the present crisis, meaning maybe. why isn't actually all of us saying that let's take the Chinese model and drive it because they're ah. driving solar right. and they're driving everything else much <coughs> better. We mustn't also forget that actually more than carbon and more than the other ecological elements, I think water and waste are incredibly important. But possibly it is not suiting the powers that be, you know, right now. I think that controls the world. And I think that may be some kind of challenge, you know, around that. So I'm not suggesting what's being done is wrong. What I'm suggesting is I think the pace of understanding that ecological footprint and measuring that by country, by company, by individual, I think is probably the key which leads to benchmarking, which leads to the change, and which leads to driving a target, which leads to actually reduction of what's required. Right, okay, so I'm gonna just Let give the- Let us comments for that. So, Sim was just yeah. waiting then, yeah. Lee Feng, and then put your hands up, because these guys are gonna talk all afternoon unless you get your hands up quickly. Sim and then Lee Feng. Yeah. Ranjit, Ranjit, I think, just makes a, a hugely important point, uh, which I'd like to, to support. And that is that we run the grave danger in a lot of these debates to forget the human beings in this whole process. Um, and I would submit that certainly from a South African and an African perspective, the problem is outright a human one. It has to do with poverty, inequality, unemployment, and environmental degradation. And frankly, the four of them interconnect on the African continent. And the solution to them has to be interconnected. And again, a plug for South Africa, I think the policies being executed by the authorities here are dealing with that problem in an interconnected way. Frankly, also in the same way as uh, mitigation uh, and adaptation is being dealt with as interconnected uh, concepts. In our own case at Standard Bank, we think um, that the democratization of finance is important, but such democratization is more than simply dealing with sustainability. Absolutely. Uh, and, and environmental issues. It has to deal with the entire, entire human being and giving people access to products and services that preserve their dignity, allow them to participate as economic agents, but at returns acceptable to our shareholders given the risks that they take. Great, thanks. Leading Fang. Now the comments on that is, uh, it seems that the government, a lot of people think the time the government support quite a lot. But, uh, that's true, but however, the, the government is supported mainly from the mechanism like they learn from the Germany like feeding tariff. That's the most important thing so the government set up the environment for the kind of renewable technology development. Like 10 years ago, China went tripping almost equal zero. But in the 2004, they introduced the kind of uh, the mechanism for feeding tariff which developed or generated from Germany. Then China is the China ranks the number one with the wind, also the big, very good business of, uh, for, for PV. A lot of people think the money from the government. It's not true. It's the government from the customers. Uh, for example, for the, for the tariff, the, 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 the collector is kind of like uh, 0.1 fund of, uh, per kilowatt hours uh, for, to support uh, the kind of a renewable development. I think, uh, the government play a very important role, but not direct from the financing issues, but from the policy environment. Then they use that good environment, then all the financing people come in. For example, the PV sectors, where the money come from? Not from China, from USA. All the, like, uh, like GCL, uh, Suntech, like uh, Yingli, all the money from New York stock market. Uh, That's the, the environment. If you have a good environment, the money is coming. Great, thank you. And if you want to learn more about financing of China's clean revolution and happen to read Mandarin, the Climate Group's just published a report on that which is on our website and will be translated in English if we can find a sponsor next year. So, <laughs> questions from the floor. There are a lot of themes here. Interestingly, one of what Ranjit said, this is a very Western Northern perspective and yet we have representatives, I take Kayo as a Brazilian, from every member of the basic group of countries here on the stage. And so I think we're seeing a, quite an interesting blend of different perspectives. Let's have some questions on that or any other theme that we've had so far. Gentlemen at the back there, if you could stand up and say what your name is and if you're directing it to someone specifically, please say so. 
Good afternoon, distinguished panel. My name is Richard Kyle. I'm the executive director of Regency Foundation Networks, and we're an organization that facilitate partnerships between the UN and business. My question to the distinguished panel is as follows. Given the role of people, and perhaps the power of people, putting aside Ranjit's points in terms of top-down, but rather referring to the bottom-up notion, how do we feel the Occupy movement could contribute to bring about progress in the climate change arena? Occupy movement. Okay, so this is a question about the <coughs> Occupy movement, which, as many of you will know, has been occupying parts of the city of London and Wall Street and other financial centres, uh, probably in protest against two of the institutions on this stage in particular, demanding change. Let's start with, with Sim and then you, Kayo, and then others, if you have a view on whether the Occupy <laughs> movement has anything to add. And if you don't want to speak, Occupy then feel climate. free not to. <laughs> Uh, I have difficulty answering the question because the problem doesn't arise in South Africa, firstly. Secondly, South Africa was ranked number two as the safest and soundest financial system in the world after Canada by the World Economic Forum. Thirdly, financial institutions in South Africa are real economy institutions. They are inextricably intertwined with the economies and much less capital markets intensive and therefore some of the things that are being objected to by the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement don't apply in South Africa. What is serious in South Africa and what needs urgent uh, attention, as I said, is an unemployment rate of 25% on the narrow definition, uh, a Gini coefficient uh, which is the highest in the world, and uh, poverty that would make you cry. And those are the three issues that need to be dealt with in South Africa. And the role of financial institutions in that process has to be to contribute to resolving those conflicts as well as dealing with, uh, with sustainability. So I, I'm unable to answer the question. Okay. Kai, do you have any thoughts on this? If you uh, put aside the extremes of the Occupy with violence, I mean, obviously there's something also healthy going on here. And uh, frankly, in my country, whether it's the exit from nuclear power or whether it's even building new big railway stations. I can tell you there is, in the positive sense, Occupy movements all over the place. And I think uh, given some of the failings of politics that I refer to, and I was part of that myself, um, that's healthy. But it also shows that uh, there is enormous need, and we haven't done that well. We haven't done it well on the whole concept of Europe, to use a different example certainly haven't done enough on, on climate and, and the new narrative, as I called it, to bring consumer awareness uh, along. Although actually on the climate issues, I think consumers are often leading their governments, what I called civil society demands, but still politics doesn't respond, but then we have business uh, come in. So I would welcome uh, more of that. And I think with the next generation, Facebook generation, and all the new ways of putting pressure, I really hope that for the next big crisis, unless we address it now, we will see more of, in a positive sense, Occupy um, uh, movement. Even in China now, I mean, more than reported, there is on water, on, on all these environmental and other issues, great awareness. And uh, I talked to students at Beijing University, which I a lecture, enormous awareness and knowledge in this next generation which also manifests itself through the modern means of social media and so on. So I'm in favor, but it also points to a serious shortcoming of having, having brought that dialogue, that discourse to the appropriate level. By the way, if you then talk about coalitions, let's merge these coalitions. Let's, for example, when I, we talk about the big 50 companies in consumer goods industry retailing getting together, they are closer to these consumers than say the cement industry. So I would start rolling it up by coalition, say, in that sector, rather than starting with energy and cement, and then create this bottom-up dynamic several of us talked about in a smart way, taking them on board. Yeah, this, for, for such kind of a phenomenon, they uh, occupy the Wall Street or something else. Uh, but uh, let's give the lessons we should learn, also tell the, the young generations. Money is important, but the, use the money to make money should be, be careful. It's, uh, very few people can play such a game. You have to work. You have to manufacture. 
that's the reason why the Germany, like uh, Sweden and uh, and uh, the Denmark, they have less trouble. The reason that they have really manufacturing something, they do some money. I think uh, you say that happened in Iceland. They make some big trouble two years ago or three years ago. Uh, now they go to New York and they go to London. See this area try to use make money, use money to make money. That's good, but it's a small group of people. It's not a large game. You couldn't. All the people use such kind of things, use money to make money. You have to do something. That's the truth. Okay, so the, the, revolu the business revolution we need is about the real economy, that being center stage. That's true. Very that's true. Like the manufacturing, that we go back to manufacturing. Of course, the only manufacturing is, is uh, useless. Also, we need the financial system. But we should tell the truth. Money make money is a short, small business. Not all the business, not all. Not all the business. Ranjit, did you want to say something? And I'm going to have one more question, so get yourself ready if you've got one. Ranjit. See, I believe that the entire New York, Wall Street and uh, phenomena, meaning needs to be re-examined in the sense that all, the whole world actually over the last 50 years since World War II moved to the regime of actually following the Wall Street model. It was, in fact, this great European and American dream that everybody aspired to in Asia. All of us wanted five cars, five holidays, five homes. And Wall Street is nothing but a phenomenon of that. And in fact, unless this is reinvented, because this all comes on the back of 200 years of industrialization, this comes on the back of land, labor, capital, and organization by Adam Smith, and all good, free economy, capitalism, all that is good. I think, basically, there has to be a balance, and you know, much has been said in terms of the experts uh, who said it here. But just as an observer from outside, I do believe that actually money doesn't come easily, and gambling, last of all, is possibly just where human beings go. And I'm saying gambling always has a, you know, you win some and you lose some. And that's possibly the end of meaning the challenge that we have in terms of just uh, trading of shares in Wall Street, because unless it changes, the same phenomena will come back. You can't do cost correction now. You'll have to do radical surgery. Otherwise, this whole thing will not come back. OK, gentlemen at the back there, Stan in pink. And then I'm going to ask, before the question, I'm going to ask all, all of you to have one comment, what you would like to see your companies do in 2012, collectively with, business, with other businesses or with government or with civil society to kickstart the change we want to see. Stan. Thank you. Uh, Stan Stonaker from Hub Culture. We're a social network, and we're very active in digital currency. Further to your last point, in various uh, sectors in the internet, there's a lot of talk now about uh, mobile payments, about digital currency, and about alternative currencies. So there is a school of thought out there that shows that if you have a digital currency or tradable currencies in the financial markets that were at least a little bit backed by carbon, you could actually turn everything upside down and fund everything that you wanted. So I'm just wondering what the panel thinks about alternative currencies and whether or not we couldn't use a private currencies to fund some of the change we need. OK, let me ask you, Mwambu, first. This is talking about digital currencies. You're in the heart of the digital industry. A few thoughts from you on this. Well, we found, we did a survey last year looking at an African country in Kenya where they have a very advanced mobile banking system called M-Pesa. Uh, we found that obviously an investment is required which puts up a bit of a carbon footprint, but the payback is 65 times greater. <coughs> and it's very practical. What we found is that a lot of people in Africa in particular don't have bank accounts, particularly rural people. Now by enabling them to join the banking sector through mobile banking, they, uh, by the way, there are a lot of reasons why. Sometimes it's not money, it's just that somebody who isn't well-educated, presentable, feels intimidated when they go into a bricks and mortar in a town. Then there's the cost issue of how to get there and get back. So by providing this system where they can use mobile banking, we found they lower their carbon footprint, uh, they get into the formal economy, and then a whole new ecosystem comes up whereby people are buying uh, life insurance in Zimbabwe using mobile payments. Uh, people are using microcredit. So they're using these tools to develop their world. And I'm sure it's good for the banks as well because they're going into a new sector. There is a gap there between who is responsible, is the operator the bank, is the bank the bank, and what happens with cross-border remittances. And of course, if you know the numbers in Africa, a lot more money comes in from remittances. Africans living abroad sending money back home that comes in from 
much overseas aid, government aid, from government to government. So this is an important sector. If we can remove these things, I think the African economies will be much better developed. And of course, when you empower somebody to take control of their life by being in control of their finance, it helps them a lot. But it's not just in the banking sector we've done this. We also have mobile, uh, mobile weather alerts. Most of the economy in Africa is still agricultural. And yet we have something like 5% of the weather stations needed. So this doesn't make sense. A farmer, if they knew rain was coming and their produce was ready to be harvested, and the rain would uh, transform the roads so they couldn't uh, take their produce to market or it would ruin their crop, of course they're going to pick up that crop and take it to the market as fast as possible. So the mobile weather alerts will help them do that and the mobile auction will help them determine the best price. If you're sitting on your farm and you can auction your crop, get the highest price, get it agreed so that you don't all land up in the sole market 10 kilometers down from your farm with the same produce and suddenly on, on Monday, there's 10,000 kilos of potatoes. And on Friday, there's zero. You can guess the pricing mechanism. If you spread out your produce, you'd all achieve a higher rate of return. This also means that if to achieve the same income, you can farm less, then you can leave some land fallow, so it will be better. <laughs> so it's a whole ecosystem which we can create around this. But I'm not so sure that we're ready for what you're proposing yet. Let's first get more people into this system of mobile money and its whole ecosystem, then we can see how to translate that further. Maybe in some markets that's applicable, but I'm not so sure we're ready for that, what you're proposing in Africa yet. So I think we're really living in interesting times. Uh, for a long time, banks would not, uh, commercial banks would find it difficult to uh, do business with people that are marginalized and are not included in the financial system because uh, bricks and mortar is expensive, um, f banks usually have large fixed costs and therefore you can see the, the recurring theme. It's difficult to get in because it's too expensive, therefore we won't get in, therefore it's expensive. What the development of information technology and communications has done is that on the one hand it has blurred the distinction between IT and information companies and financial institutions. Secondly, uh, financial institutions are nothing other than factories of information and data. And as a consequence, you can conceive of a destiny, as applies to us at Standard Bank, where you can reduce the cost of service and product delivery by using the cell phone, for example. Uh, and all of a sudden, in partnership with communities and innovating social networks and social relationships, you're depressing the cost of product uh, and service delivery. As a consequence, we now have rolled out 8,000 bank shops at Standard Bank in communities that we otherwise wouldn't have done business with and are including millions of people that we otherwise wouldn't have done business with, and it's at prices that are acceptable to, to, to those customers. And so underlying that proposition is a truth, which I think most banks are, are confronting, and that's certainly the case uh, in, in Africa. Okay. Right, so to finish, I'm just gonna start, summarize a little bit, and then I'm gonna ask for a final, very short final word from each of you. It seems to me from Kayo's model, we used to have Civil society, the likes of me, pressurizing government, usually using moral arguments to put policy into place. Business would wait for that policy to be in place and then react to it. Not always certain that the policy was going to survive forever, so perhaps hedging their bets. And that's provided a model, created a model where we haven't moved at the scale or the speed necessary. What we need to see, and what we are seeing, is civil society is mobilizing. It's been much more sophisticated, covering, covering a broad range of approaches, willing to work with business as well as against it, work with governments. And that's driving not directly only policy change, but needs to drive innovative business coalitions, new approaches, sometimes based on open source IP, which co companies and civil society can share, but also importantly to demonstrate to, to politicians what works, how it can work. These are all complex problems and we don't expect politicians to be masters of everything, so they need to know what works, what the key challenges are, and what businesses need all over the world to make these things come to speed and scale. And we mentioned, talked about the idea that digital technology of one kind or another is going to be very much at the, part, at the heart of this. And the, the report that um, one we mentioned about 15% reduction in global emissions reductions from ICT was something that we worked on as well. 
and we're seeing that being implemented already. So if we want to have these coalitions, we want to have these success stories, and we want them to, to transmit them to politicians so they can put the TLC policies in place. And let's think in Rio, in six months' time, like one groundbreaking idea from each of you, what would that coalition, what would that big idea that we would demonstrate in Rio look like that would help politicians to go, OK, we can do this. We're not arguing about the cost. We're creating the opportunity. Kaya, you go first. Yeah, I think Rio is the right word. I think we should have, say, five leading CEOs. Uh, say the head of the Brazilian Development Bank, who thinks very much around this, and they're huge, BNDS. One leading Brazilian being asked by Dilma, and say three, one for technology company, uh, consumer goods, some of the big names, I want to mention names now, to, f to uh, form that, pull, uh, that platform in Rio that would, re that would launch a number of very credible cross-industry uh, bottom-up coalitions with real results and targets and present that too but not by way of now you have to take action but we all do it anyway but you can support us to the uh, to the leaders uh, part of that second is indeed that scaling up we hopefully will have a good GCF discussion uh, result this week we have to do that painstaking work uh, and many four are working on it to find the right best practice for scaling up and that could also be brought into that but I think thirdly we also have to contribute for Rio to this new narrative of resource productive growth to inspire to inform and to form again coalitions and these CEOs would be good transmission belts this new story because at the moment I mean with the UN not being stuck and uh, the crisis occupying people's mind Rio also needs a new push in that uh, in that direction. So we are modest contribution we will, we will make and I think we will all make here. If I could make a final point, I very much agree with some of the points India raises and India well also in terms of the post-Kyoto regime. But please, and there are so many brilliant thinkers and industries in Tata itself in India, to convince your government to be part of the solution also this week, to commit to commit later doesn't mean that you get absolute caps that in the end from you are the lowest three or four tons per capita we all have to be at six at the end of the century but you don't want to move up the Himalayas either and then come painfully down again to six tons per capita Brazil seems to be willing to move China seems to be willing to move exposing the US by saying we agree if everybody agrees by 2020 to uh, stringent international binding targets India is a bit the laggard and I hope that will not be the case, so that in Rio, we still India in the forefront. Fantastic. Yi Feng, what's your big idea you'd like to see? Yeah, how to see that? So since today's topic is the business revolution for environment, I think the revolution is not such easy. Not like the, the financing revolution, but not like a digital uh, revolution. Since we couldn't use the internet to fly from Beijing to Japan, we have to have the infrastructure. We have to take the Airbus or Bond, nothing else. We couldn't take the internet directly from Beijing to Japan. That means every kind of development, you have developed the basic industries, infrastructure. That's the kind of revolution that you needed by most of the people. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> I, I think I would love to see around this idea of the nexus, water, food, climate change and energy, that you had five dynamic ideas started, not a call to action as, called, uh, as Kaya rightly says, but that these are already up and running. They don't need a mandate from anyone, uh, where you've got committed leadership, real champions behind that who are really driving that nexus conversation and uh, with international organisations, private sector, local and international involved. Uh, if we could come up with that kind of dazzle by, uh, by within six months, which is a very tall ask, uh, I think it would be very exciting. Great, Sim. Uh, um, at that point, maybe you've got um, 
the link between domestic policies and multilateral policies are all uh, harmonized, uh, and there's clarity on incentives uh, and penalties, uh, and we found a way to live up the $100 um, uh, billion dollars by multiples uh, using uh, private sector pension funds, insurance, uh, and uh, asset managers and banking finance. Because we believe that ICT has such a strong role to play in reducing carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, I, if governments could agree on harmonization of spectrum, there's a unique opportunity. Many countries around the world are moving from analog to digital, and there are huge debates as what happens to the spectrum. If they harmonize and agree a certain band for mobile broadband, then the, the vendors can harmonize the equipment they produce, the cost of production can go down, the cost of all the related equipment to use it can go down. More people will have access to higher quality IT, and it will feed on to more broadband happening, more work being done, lower carbon footprint. If we had decent uh, networks around the world, a lot of the work that we do where we travel somewhere or have to deliver a document, all of that will go. And there's a unique opportunity right now with harmonization of spectrum. Asia has agreed, pretty much. Africa is on the verge of agreeing, but Europe is a bit behind on this one for various reasons. Okay, finally, uh, Just two points, you know, I started with them. One is I think if Rio can insist that every company in every country has an ecological footprint, and two, that compliance management, both published and otherwise, must happen, both at a private level and at a government level. Just two points. Okay, thank you very much. Are you going to say one last very brief well, thing? Well, it just think. occurred to me that it might be appropriate to mention here. President Zuma, this week in a discussion where very much this bottom-up philosophy approach was discussed, and I don't want to speak for him, but I think supported by him and his cabinet, he said if the IT innovation was, had, had been put way back to international negotiating process, we would all still use a typewriter. <laughs> Indeed. So, on that note, some great ideas. B4E, I know, are looking in Rio to bring forward some really transformational projects. WWF, one of the sponsors here, I know, will want to be part of that, and the Climate Group would support that too. So, let me just finally thank my six panelists, Ranjit, Sean, Li Feng, Sim, Kayo, and Wambu for their great interventions and their inspirational thoughts this afternoon. Thank you all.